Okay. I think those are all of the details. <clears throat> Again, my name is Matt Reichert, the Director of Outreach and Engagement at GIA Publications. Awfully glad to have you with us. <laughs> I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves and we'll go in the order that all of you appear on my screen. So Allison, if you would begin um, with an introduction and we'll kind of go around the horn here. Sure, thank you, Matt. My name is Allison Benders and I'm on the faculty of the Jesuit School of Theology we're an international theology center for lay people and uh, candidates preparing for ordained ministry. Um, so our question about inclusivity is, um, and inclusive practice is really, really vital. Um, I also teach a course on race, theology, and justice. So racial justice is one of my areas of study. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful, great. Um, Darrell and Darnell, you're in the same screen, so I'll have you guys go next. Hi, I'm Darrell St. Romain, and I am Director of Music at Mary Immaculate Catholic Church in Formers Branch, Texas. And I am also uh, a doctor of pastoral music, a uh, student at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. And I am Darnell St. Romain. I am his older twin brother. And I am at Prince of Peace Catholic Community in Plano, Texas. I serve as the Associate Director of Liturgical Music. Uh, my boss is online right now watching Brent McWilliams. He's the Director of Music at uh, Prince of Peace. And I'm also a DPM student at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. All right, great. And then next up, last but not least, Father Bradley. Everyone, I'm Father Bradley Zamora, and I serve as the Director of Worship and International Students at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary, just outside of Chicago. And I also work as the Director of Worship and Music for Faith of Chicago, which is part of our renewal movement in the Archdiocese of Chicago as we renew the church, as we say here in our local community. And I guess being a doctoral student is the thing to do on this panel, because I also am one um, at the Institute for Pastoral Leadership. So it's great to be with all of you today. All right, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much, panel, and thank you, participants who are joining us live. We're, we're awfully glad that you're here for the conversation. Again, this is a conversation, so please, um, everyone joining us, add your questions, add your comments, and we'll keep the dialogue going here. Um, to, to begin, um, Allison, I'm wondering if you can help us form sort of a common basis here. For, for the conversation, just so we have a, um, a similar starting off point. We're, we're talking about inclusive practice. We're talking about notions of inclusion. So could you provide for us just to begin sort of a, a theological basis for why this is something that's important to us as Christians, why this is a topic that we all need to, to think about, learn about, do better at? Good. Well, thank you, Matt. That's a really big question, but let me try and uh, make two important points. And one of the questions, or I, the way I think of it, is why is inclusive practice important, especially in the liturgy, because that's where most of us connect with the church. Um, and of course, we want to include everybody. We want liturgies to be welcoming and meaningful. But sometimes when we say inclusive liturgy, um, we think, oh, we have to be politically correct or Maybe we have to sing in a foreign language. And those are things, those ideas aren't helpful. I mean, it's really important that we keep in mind what the purpose of liturgy is. And that's the public worship of the church. And the purpose of liturgy, especially mass, is to bring us together and to invite us to participate, to help us engage God. So of course it makes sense that our liturgies are ways that people in the community can feel at home and can express themselves. And this goes back all the way right to Jesus. Um, Jesus was inclusive, inviting everybody to the table. St. Paul, as he traveled, didn't require people to become Jewish. The Gentiles were able to express their faith in their ways, and he tried to communicate in those ways. So theologically, when we think about the importance of liturgy, it's really important to think about inclusivity and engaging people. I think just one more quick point also, this is not just a theoretical or liturgical matter, which is really important, but it's also a question of moral and racial justice. So we've had, we live in a society, right, that's divided along race and ethnic lines. Our churches and parishes are often, you know, divided. We use images longstanding of um, Jesus is blonde and blue-eyed. We say things like we have to, sin is black or evil. 
And those kinds of things aren't helpful. And those images exclude people. So the church and our worship is also an opportunity to witness to the table, the beloved community that invites others. Um, and we have to be a church in the world, and that's our role. So it's both the purpose of liturgy and also the purpose of witnessing to what God's community can be. Yeah, so I'll I, ask others. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's great, and I think that's a that's a, a helpful a helpful place to begin. And in a in a moment, um, Bradley, I'm going to ask you to talk about how you know as as your teaching um, liturgy at, at St. Mary's and at Mundelein, you know, how um, uh, any of the things that you're, you're teaching, how, how inclusivity, you know, sort of abuts that, if that's a, a conversation. And I want to talk to um, and hear from Darnell and Darrell about sort of the, the practical side as, as practitioners, as music directors, how you experience this. Um, before we do that, one, one passage that as I think about this, um, I've been coming back to, and that's from um, Lumen Gentium, right? Um, one of the one of the great documents to come out of Vatican II, and I'm I'm looking particularly at paragraph thirteen, and 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 forgive the forgive the exclusive language right here as I as I read this, but um, Lumen Gentium says, all men are called to belong to the new people of God. Wherefore, this people, while remaining one and only one, is to be spread throughout the whole world and must exist in all ages, so that the degree of God's will may be fulfilled. In the beginning, God made human nature one and decreed that all his children, scattered as they were, would finally be gathered together as one. It was for this purpose that God sent his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. It, and then I'm skipping some things. It follows that though there are many nations, there is but one people of God, which takes its citizens from every race, making them citizens of a kingdom, which is of a heavenly rather than of an earthly nature. And so, I mean, as we, as we think about this in terms of how we think about the people of God, as we think about the liturgy, the things we profess, we, we profess an inclusive, one united people of God in the things that we do. So, so I'm wondering um, if we could go in that order, Bradley, as, as you teach the liturgy, how do you talk about this, this theological, spiritual, practical basis for in inclusion? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a great question because even beyond my classroom, but I think for all of us, one of the things that we have to always wrestle with as church, okay, is that the church is not just the four walls of the building that we're a part of. So when we speak of inclusivity, it's not only who is in front of me, that's a great starting point for this. You know, does the community find a reflection in the way in which that local church is praying is so important. But also, is there an inclusivity of how church, the one holy Catholic apostolic that we profess, is that represented in the four walls of the church that I'm the priest at, or one of my students will be the priest at. And I think that's the tension for really all ministers to have this, can we say, global perspective of inclusivity, of making sure that we're not only reflective and welcoming to the people who are in our pews week after week, but we're also reflective and welcome to the struggles that the church as a whole is experiencing in a particular moment. You know, the perfect example, I, I mean, and I'll pull on it because I think it, it strikes a chord in everyone is, you know, we don't have black people at our parish. So why does it matter that our priest or our ministers there say black lives matter? Well, I mean, St. Paul speaks of the body of Christ, right? And if one member of the body of Christ is suffering, then the whole body of Christ suffers. So that's why it matters. And, and, and that's really a way of getting at inclusivity. I think that's a tangible thing that so many of us are wrestling with right now that gives rise to the importance of not just who's in our pews, but who's a part of this global family that we call one holy Catholic and apostolic. And to bring that into a classroom, I think is sometimes challenging because we form priests, you're going to go to a specific place, you're going to minister to these people, but we're not ordained or sent to a specific community. We're ordained for the church. Yes, a specific diocese or a specific religious order, but there's a wholeness that we have to have as ordained ministers, as I would say any disciple in the body of Christ should have to make sure that we're 
bringing everyone along on the journey of faith with us. So that's a, that's a starting point. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. So, so then moving to like this, this, um, I want to say practical application, but from the, this practitioner experience, I mean, Dar Darnell and Darrell being music directors in parishes right now, how, how do these concepts inform your approach to ministry? I mean, we're going to, we're going to get into some of the how to, and what does this look like and where do, where do problems um, lie, but how does this basis for inclusivity inform the, your approach to planning and ministering in your own community? Well, I, I, I serve at Prince of Peace, which is mostly a Caucasian parish, and there are a few ink blots like me running around. And so until March, May 25th, 2020, I was a very invisible person. And then all overnight, I became very visible. People wondering, how are you doing? How are you coping? How is it uh, for you? Um, and my response was, I've been black my entire life. This is nothing new. What's new is you seeing yeah. the reality I've had to live in my entire life. So for your world, it came crashing down. I can't believe this is happening. How could this happen? Um, as whereas well for me, you know, I, we've been dealing with lynchings in one form or fashion for years you know, indentured servitude, they say was happening. No, we were captured, brought over in ships and chains and bondage, you know, worked, they say 1619, but actually the first slaves came over from the Spaniards in 1510 in North America, okay? So 1619 is only important because that's when the British came over here, but it happened before. So we're gonna add another 100 years or so to this, okay? So 500 years of, uh, 250 years of free labor, 500 years of oppression, I'm fine. What's not fine is you grappling with all of these layers you see unraveling before you. So the lie is unraveling. And what I mean by the lie is this, I discovered America. I brought together pilgrims and Indians and we had a feast and we call it Thanksgiving. And then somehow I'm gonna pass down generations of wealth because I have free labor. You know, these things are starting to unravel, our coping with them, right? We never had mass reconciliation for black people, but we never had a mass psychological examination of our minds. So we have to deal with this. But as far as practicality, so how does this really work in the real world? I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna start with a relationship. Okay. A relationship, a genuine relationship. Not you daying and down looking on me and allowing me in your space a genuine relationship of mutual understanding and forgiveness and love. And love is important. You have to understand that I don't think like you. I might be educated by your schools and work in your parishes, but my life experiences are vastly different from yours. I've had to work twice as hard to once again buy into the lie and then produce something that the lie tells me I need to produce. And I've done that, I've worked very hard, you know? Um, but it's not reality. The lie is not reality. And so we need to grapple with what Catholicism is in America, because Catholicism in America is not what Catholicism really is. It's not what my brothers and sisters in Indonesia experience, not what my brothers and sisters in South Africa experience, and certainly not what my brothers and sisters in Nigeria experience. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very universal thing. When I, Father Bradley, I don't like global because global implies a worldview from one location. I do like universal experience. Yeah, so when we talk about universality, we need to be aware that if somebody is not in the mix, then I'm not complete, right? So if I don't acknowledge 
For instance, in Plano, we have 20% Asian population in the city of Plano. It's an overrepresentation in Plano, whereas in the state of Texas, there's only an 8% Asian population. So why are they not in my church at Prince of Peace? I have to grapple with that. They'd rather go somewhere else and worship. And it's nothing, this is not a judgment call. This is just an observation, you know? And so we have to think about these things. It seems that inclusivity is, you know, Anglo-Hispanic more than anything else in America when we're leaving out all of these other cultures. So how do we deal with that? Those are just questions I'm throwing out there, so. Yes, uh, and speaking about Anglo-Hispanic uh, relationships, in my parish, is, is that is very much the reality I am in. Uh, there are eight weekend masses, uh, five of which are in English, uh, excuse me, nine weekend masses, five of which are in English, three in Spanish, and one in French. Uh, and so it is, it is good to have a, a parish that is diverse in that aspect, uh, but you still, we still grapple with the silos, uh, okay? So this is only the Spanish mass, this is only the English mass, uh, and, and the Silos happen within the community and also happens within styles of music that happen uh, within the mass. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in America, we have uh, put the contemporary mass always at the, the evening, Sunday evening mass, and that is your contemporary music. And, and this is to, you know, to falsely capture in youth. <laughs> Uh, to uh, get them to attend mass regularly and to have uh, your youth night or whatever afterwards. Uh, and, and, and then we have uh, the Spanish masses where, uh, where you have geographic regions of, of, of people who gather together. Uh, in, 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 in my community, uh, uh, the, the uh, Spanish speakers from Mexico are coming to the 9 a.m. mass on Sunday. And then you have other Central American masses, uh, well, people who are from Central America that go to the other masses. So when you have, we have these uh, cliques that happen within a community, which is totally natural. Uh, but how, how do we get past that? How do we foster a, a one community? And if it cannot happen in the liturgy, it's not going to happen anywhere else. It's, it's really not. And, and so when, when choosing resources, uh, when, when educating people uh, of how to come together to learn from one another, and again, to be in relationship with one another uh, is the ultimate task. Because as, as much as we have our uh, Spanish masses and even our French masses, mass, when we come together, we have to become Eurocentric, or that is the force that is driving us. Well, we'll, we'll give them one Spanish song. Okay, we'll give them a French song. Uh, we don't care what it is. We're just going to give it to them. And, and, and that's going to make us uh, inclusive in our practice, inclusive in our community, and we're going to be one, and we're going to, yay, we're going to pat ourselves on the back, and we had a good mass, uh, and then we go home, and, and we'll have this again another six months or a year later, uh, and so, and that, that is the hard reality, and even though I, I may want to do more of it, the drawback is, is that what, it takes a lot of work to even produce something that might be multicultural or bilingual or trilingual. And we shy away from that uh, because, well, they have their mass or we have our mass. We have our space. They have their space. Let them do what they want in their own space. And, and nobody has to be uncomfortable if that happens. Uh, and so I, I'm in liturgy. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Okay. So let's make everybody uncomfortable and come together and use Latin, you know, it's, it's not a good solution, but it, it makes us all uncomfortable together, at least in, in communities that I serve. Uh, 
So finding a way to embrace everyone's culture and also at the same time recognize that we are in, in a Roman Catholic church and embrace that uh, culture as well. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do well, and it's a hard thing to do effectively. It's a hard thing to do every week. And uh, it is nice to worship within your own culture space and with your, within people, with around people who look like you. But to break away from that is, is the real harder practice. And it's a very messy practice. I want to um, also uh, um, ride on your coattails about what you said about relationship, because I'm hearing your work as um, music ministers and Father Bradley's work as a priest. And from somebody who's in the pews, um, I know it's so easy to say, oh, well, it's your job to make it inclusive. And um, so I want to say two things. One, right, it's, it's also, I think of it as my job as part of the faith community to help um, welcome that or to participate. But some of it also is trying to move from head, like this is the right thing to do, I'll be a good Catholic and I'll, to the relationship, that when it becomes personal, that this is the community and this is what we look like, how we speak, where we live, that helps, um, I found, helps me to welcome new experiences in liturgy because they're related to the people I know and care about. Um, so I, I offer that as somebody in the pews. Yeah, there, there. Um, I've, I've seen uh, as we think about this topic or any topic, you know, and the need to first define our terms. And sometimes it's easier to define something by what it isn't than by what it is. You know, as we walk around it. Um, I've seen some people talk about or heard some people talk about inclusive practice as um, or inclusivity as the ability for everyone to to see something of themselves in what they're experiencing. So, so as, a, as an educator, you know, do, if I have an inclusive classroom, can my students see something of themselves or their experience in the readings on my syllabus? Can they see something of themselves and their preferred learning styles or the way they learn best in the activities that I design in my classroom, et cetera? And if we think about that, that seeing and being seen, there's the, if, if, we, if we stick with that for a second, there's the need for those of us who are planning liturgies or leading um, pastoral ministry to be intentional. There's also then the, the um, we have to go beyond the box checking of, well, clearly someone who speaks French in my community should see themselves because we sang the one French song we know, <laughs> right? Again, um, so check the box. To also, how is my, inclusionary practice helping other people who who don't um you know affiliate with this particular group also see members of that group within our community there's a there's a i need to be seen but also i need to see others and i think that's a it pushes us beyond perhaps some of the the um dangers of the tokenism that can result um and the lip service that can result from from some of these overall practices we have, um, we have a question here, um, and I, I have a feeling that you, um, Father Bradley, will, will bear the brunt of the responding to the question. Um, and this is from Carlos, and he asks, how are these issues of inclusivity being addressed at seminaries? Um, particularly, we're clergy is in formation, but we might even broaden the conversation to talk about anyone who's in formation for some sort of pastoral leadership. Right, but particularly here, the question is about seminaries. Many times it seems to be a disconnect between the vocational, quote, original call before entering seminary, and many times the way formation transforms new clergy um, after they're ordained. So, um, Father Bradley, if you want to take the lead on responding to that question. Yeah, I, I mean, quite simply, even beyond the walls of the seminary that I serve at, I think for any institution, the question or the answer probably is not enough. We're probably not having these conversations enough. Now I can tell you that in, in this present moment, there's a specific group of us, um, faculty and students together who are looking just at this question. Um, and certainly what has happened in our local community here in the States has given rise to a greater awareness of that in all of us, that we need to come together and have these conversations. 
Um, but even beyond, you know, what we're doing at this present moment, I think the ability for our men in seminary to have the conversation that both now Allison and Darnell and Durrell have said of relationship is important because all of us can sit in a classroom as a cohort or a group of students and be learning something. I think it's something completely different to know how someone got to be where they are or you know what is the baggage in a good sense that someone is bringing into their experience of ecclesiology or moral theology or liturgics in my particular case. Um, and so one of the exercises that I did with our men as they were going off for their six month internship back in their diocese was to have them sit in small groups and answer the question of um, who is Jesus to me? Mm -hmm. And how from that relationship has it led me from baptism, my original foundational vocation, to now this expression of it of service in ordained ministry in the church. And I was shocked um, that many of them had never talked to each other about that before. And I think because it's an uncomfortable conversation to have because it involves vulnerability, mm -hmm. which when we speak of inclusivity, I don't think you can have inclusivity without the vulnerability of all those who are involved um, at the table. And so when we speak of you know, how is inclusivity being talked about? Right? Certainly one of the ways that, that I talk about it is, I may have the title of director of worship or you might be the director of music or whatever it is, but if we're making the decisions about a specific group of people in our parish and how that manifests itself in our community, that's not being inclusive, but that's just, as you said, Matt, checking a box. I think inclusivity comes when members of whatever community we're talking about are actually at the table and we're listening to how they can authentically see each other in the expression of the liturgy that we're trying to do. So there's a lot there, but I think it gives us, you know, beyond seminary for all of us as ministers to wrestle with is who is at the table or are we just making decisions and ultimately we're being exclusive and not inclusive at all. Yeah. I think of, um, you know, what the psalmist says, you know, from presumption, restrain your servant, you know, and let it not rule over me. I think sometimes when we don't have, when we don't, I mean, uh, to build relationship, and I, I think that's, that's such a helpful basis for this and so many other conversations. If we, we, if we don't have a relationship, if, or, or I should say it this way, it's easier to foster that authentic relationship by obviously actually interacting and dialoguing with people by giving space at the table where planning is happening and where conversation is happening so that the experience of people in my community does not get just filtered through my own assumptions or my own presumptions, right? And oftentimes the, albeit perhaps unintended, messages of exclusion come in because of the fact that maybe too few people from a narrow slice are responsible for trying to assume and presume the experience of everybody else. And therefore, of course, we're going to miss things. You know, I think of the example of, um, and again, as we talk about inclusion and exclusion, we can talk about this on, on any, any sort of, diff, you know, um, uh, topic or, or you know, whether it be age or whether it be race, socioeconomic status, it's a gender um, orientation. And I think about, you know, how we do things at, at, around mothers and Mother's Day. You know, and my colleague Kate Williams and, and the book that she edited of Womb and Tomb, looking at resources for women and families and, and parents who have experienced, you know, infant loss or stillbirth or miscarriage. And, you know, when, when we don't have the visible experience of someone who has experienced, you know, who has, uh, um, you know, whose lives have been touched by stillbirth, miscarriage, infant loss, it's easy for us to forget those experiences. And when we talk about motherhood on Mother's Day or in May, as though there's one experience, you know, and we forget the pain that that causes, or we aren't fully present to the other realities or experience of this topic, we miss something. And part of that is because we don't have those experiences fully represented, right? I mean, we miss things the fewer people are involved in, in planning and participating. Um, could I go ahead, please? Could I add just something um, quickly about um, a, another approach? One of the approaches that we use at the theology is to double down on um, cultural understanding culture from a um, 
analytic and academic theoretical perspective, but also then as a practical way. Because we say, you know, the church emerged from a particular culture, right? The early Christians were Jewish, right? And then they move into the Roman world and the Greek world, and then they go around the world to India, Africa, and so on. Um, so uh, when we understand culture, we can also put our culture and how it forms us and what it enables us to even think about and experience, then we can decenter that and enable, to recognize, enable us to recognize other cultures. So one thing to do is to, or... I think about is to try and step back and help educate people because we often are blind like fish swimming in water. We don't know our own cultures like the water we swim in until we actually begin to understand that. And then inclusive liturgy asks what are, you know, what are the language and image and, and things that we need that will speak to the cultures that are present in the church. Can I um, go yeah, along with that? Uh, when we talk about uh, inclusivity in the U.S., we have to deal with um, demythologizing, decolonizing, um, and this will take you know years of work because even um, I'll give you an example, and I'm not saying what I'm about to say is an, is an example of colonialism. It was just an experience that I had growing up, and then. I wanted to translate that into my first job and I got backlash. So uh, during um, Lent, we would say the mass propers in Latin. I mean, we were African-American parish, uh, um, an SVD parish. So um, this was quite natural to me to sing the, the Sanctus and, and the Agnus Dei and the Kyrie, uh, no credo and, and no uh, pater nostrum. Um, but when I wanted to translate that into my parish that I was working at in the Diocese of Dallas, I had so many backlash because a lot of people just did not know Latin. And for me, I was like, hmm, this is a Eurocentric environment. How could they not possibly know? So I made a huge assumption on my part that this would translate well, right? The pastor was all for it, but he didn't get the backlash. I did. Okay. <laughs> So those, that's because I was in, in relationship enough with the parish to make that kind of a move. And so what I'm saying is we train people in an ivory tower and we can throw all sorts of experiments at them. And when we go out into the world, the first thing we need to do, and I mean for like two, three years, is simply let them tell us what they want us to do. Okay, absorb all of that information. Get over all the baggage. Get over the fact that you might be more educated than them. I had to deal with that. Get over all of these things and just shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. And okay, so what happens there is a building of trust. All right. And so when, once you have that trust established, then we can do this give and take kind of a thing. I say, well, I need you to kind of sing this so you can understand that your God is not a parochial God, okay? The God I serve is bigger than Prince of Peace. The God you serve is bigger than Prince of Peace, but you might not know it yet, right? So, but that, that's, that's a vulnerability stage. That is a stage of, oh, my bubble is bigger than, than, than Plano? Yes, your bubble is bigger. Than, you are a universal citizen, but that's hard to, to, to get across. You know, but the music you sing can take you there. The music can help you make leaps. Or, I don't want to say anything bad about my contemporary brothers and sisters who play contemporary music, but limiting yourself to music in the last five years limits your worldview of how God operates in the world. And that says a lot. I have thousands of years in my rearview mirror to pull from, not just the last five. So thinking about those things. I mean, time and space intersect, heaven and earth intersect every week. And if we don't take a hold of that and really uh, imagine what all that can really entail, then we've done ourselves a disservice. So my friend, when I was in school, said his job was to sing people to heaven. And I said, dang it, I really like that. And when you think about four verse hymns, you're going to get to heaven in that last verse. 
But if you skip verse two and verse three, you don't know how you transport it there. You just don't. Okay, we're gonna sing verse one and four. I'm, I'm dealing with myself in verse one, and then all of a sudden I'm in heaven like I didn't even live? You know, this is what we deal with. And so a lot of these songs we sing today have no justice, no social justice aspect, has no idea of us transporting us out of ourselves. We get stuck in like a little turtle, you know? So we have to broaden all of our rear view mirrors. I'm not saying create a museum. I'm just saying use God, how God has revealed God's self to us over time. Don't put my God in a box because I'm going to tell you something. My God is bigger than the impossible. Okay. Yeah. You're getting your, the, the chat is, is lighting up. So <laughs> lots, of agreement. lots of agreement. No, I think, I think that's, I mean, beautifully stated and, and important to state. And, you know, a, a couple of things to, to really emphasize too becomes the, the importance of the work that is being done and the fact that the work that we do, it, it, this is, I'm going to say this in an inarticulate way and I'm thinking out loud, so apologies in advance, but oftentimes it seems like people who are involved in leading liturgical ministry are some of the people who, if you just listen to what is said, you would assume take the lowest view of the impact of the work of liturgical ministry, right? I mean, if we, if we, really, if we really believe that the work we're doing is important and has effect on the lives of our community and all who are gathered for worship and those beyond, then how could we not sing all four of those stanzas? How could we not take all of these things into consideration? Because if we think, ah, it's fine. Well, then what is that saying about the, the value of our work and the importance of our work? And, and also, I think, you know, what we we're talking about here and in inclusion gets, of course, to questions about the community and then questions about belonging which ultimately come down in the way that we have, at least within the Catholic Church, our um, parish structures structured, comes down to ownership and investment oftentimes. You know, I mean, the, the questions of, you know, it, it strikes me that if you pull any parish's mission statement, you're going to find some sort of variant of, we're a welcoming community, mm -hmm. we're all belong and all are gathered at the table and et cetera, right? And, th and that's, that's awesome. But at some point that falls down in practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it comes down to the, you know, exactly what you're what you're saying, Darnell. We we are members of a universal Catholic with a small C church. But also the way I experience that connection most vividly is within my parish unit. And that stained glass window has a picture of blonde haired, blue eyed Nordic Jesus. And I know that that's a problem, but my great grandfather paid for it, and so you can't take it down. And now I have a competing value of well, I get that I want you to be included, but this window is also really important because, I mean, we have, we have these competing values that ownership brings, and that's a tough circle to square as well. You know? yep. um, we have a bunch of things that we've talked about, um, and I want to in introduce into the conversation, if you're not familiar with this book, those of you who are participating, the book Dear Church by, by Lenny Duncan, who um, is, he is a black Lutheran pastor in the ELCA, which has the distinction of being the whitest denomination in the United States. And so he's written this book as a, as a letter, essentially, to the ELCA, but you can replace ELCA with pretty much any other, um, you know, Catholic or mainline Protestant denomination, and, and you know, it works. And a couple of things that, that have been mentioned that I want to emphasize, and again, um, as a reminder, we have um, uh, uh, this, a couple questions in the um, Q&A. We'll get to some other things in the chat, so um, with our time left, if you have something we want to get to, please, please offer those. But um, uh, he... He, Lenny, offers this, this statement. He writes that symbols are important because they shape the way we think about the world often without knowing it. And if we don't deconstruct harmful symbols, we will slowly poison our children. A very, very strong way to say this. He also writes over and over again, or excuse me, he, he begins paying lip service to blackness in the church isn't enough. What I'm proposing is something much more drastic and holistic over and over again in our music, liturgies, displayed artwork and language and word choices, we have reinforced the idea that white is holy, black equals sin. These passive suggestions have created an entire subconscious theology of race. And again, I don't, I don't wanna, wanna move us away from this strong statement on race, 
in our communities, we also can insert, again, language, we can insert gender, we can insert age, we can insert socioeconomic status, we can insert parent, parental status, we can insert sexual orientation, we can insert all sorts of things. And again, we have this message back and forth, this exclusivity. And I wonder, you know, we, we've heard a lot in the last few months about, you know, people are racist and people will claim to be not racist. And that's not a helpful duality of terms. Instead, we have to move from racism to anti-racism. And I wonder if, if we're thinking about inclusivity, if we need to move from, you know, if we need to move to anti-exclusive practice. It's not just enough to say we have inclusive practice, but how are we actively anti-exclusive in our practices, which pushes us towards authentic relationship to authentic inclusion and planning and power, seats of power and decision making, um, which challenges those assumptions of ownership and belonging perhaps in a different way if we are actively anti-exclusive, because all of us would claim to be inclusive, just look at our mission statement, but somewhere we fall down in the, in the execution of things. Um, so, so moving to this, this question of what does this look like? It can't just be mission statements because we've got that, right? It can't just be us proclaiming to be members of one holy Catholic apostolic church, talking about the universality and Catholicity of our faith because we proclaim that. So moving beyond this, what we say to now what we do, what does inclusive practice look like? How, how can we get there in these weeks, months ahead? What are the, the things we can do beyond just the lip service? I know that's a big question. <laughs> Go ahead, please, Darnell. Um, I'm reminded of a sermon that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave at his father's church at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And he's talking about um, a portion of First Kings where David wants to build God a house. And he tells the prophet Nathan his idea. And then that night Nathan goes and he has a conversation with God. And Nathan says, you got to go back and tell David, I don't need a house from him. I'm going to give it to his son to build my house. And, and then so Solomon built the temple. But what Nathan told David in the process was God wanted Nathan, David to know that it was good that it was in thine heart. This idea. Okay. So where I'm going with, with is this. If I'm trying to get back to Dallas, Texas, and I'm going to take I-10 East, knowing I need to go I-10 West, I will never get to my destination. So if I'm confronted with all of this knowledge and I decide, hey, I ain't going to do nothing with it. I'm just going to leave it there and continue on the path that I was going. It wasn't good that it was in thine heart because it never entered thine heart and entered thy mind and then it went out of thy mind, right? So relationship education is the first step. What I'm saying is this is gonna be years of progress and years of processes to get to where we need to get. But we have to start now. And that simply looks like we're in COVID-19. Some of us are not even in our offices yet. Take the time to do something where you speak of a person intentionally of a different race, of a different social economic status, if race is not an issue, all right? But you still have people who don't have the same level of education as you, same level of means as you, same level of anything as you. Talk to them and listen to what they're telling you. This is the first step of the process. So Hamilton came out. Who gets to tell your story? My people have not been able to tell their story. That's why it was great to see uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color telling a story about a founding father. This was the whole point he was trying to make. He wasn't trying to be historically accurate. He was saying that our stories have been stifled. Our stories have been mitigated and relegated to the footnotes of books, you know? So uh, who gets to tell the story? Learn the story. And I don't know how long it's going to take for us to learn the story. So once you have a relationship, then you can have a reconciliation, then you can have a revelation. 
all right? And then we will have a new theophany and manifestation of the Holy Spirit in ways that we've never seen before. In, in, in parishes, your vision or mission statement uh, is usually something that the parish is trying to say, this is what we're going to look like in 50 to 100 years if we take steps to, to create this vision or this mission. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, to put out these statements and to say, we're, we're going to do this and we're, we're going to be global. We're going to adopt a church in Central America and we're going to uh, maybe adopt a church in, in, in Africa or, another, or some third world country. And, and we'll give them our money and, and we're doing our part and, you know, we're going to build a well and, 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 and maybe add uh, some housing uh, in, in the area. Uh, but I think that's all fine and good, but are we building up the community to be inclusive at where we are around us? Does the church inside look like what the community is outside? You know, just when you go to your parking lot. Uh, and so how, how do we build that? How, how do we go about taking steps to in, include everyone without looking at money, without looking at uh, uh, lineage of, of their education or schooling? Uh, just how do we go and do about those practices? I don't have answers for that, but those are always at the forefront of my mind. Uh, are we doing enough? That's that's where I leave it. Are we doing enough? I want to add an image that's helpful for me about um, as educators. Sometimes we talk about a fixed mindset: are you right or wrong, or a growth mindset? How are you getting there? And I think of like a soccer team or something. If I want to go learn soccer, I don't walk out on the first day and go, oh, I can't do this. I quit. Like I made a mistake. You know, I look to a coach and I go, I know today, tomorrow, if I keep at it for a year, I'm going to be a better soccer player than I was the year before. And so I find sometimes to recognize um, that I'm going to make mistakes. And I can think of all of the stupid things I've said or hurtful things I've said. But trying to think if we're a faith community, and we come at it right with the intention that doesn't excuse um, uh, it doesn't excuse mistakes, but it's a recognition that we're trying. And so sometimes I find that that sort of um, growth mindset, the practice, the knowing we're going to make mistakes, asking for correction, asking for more insight um, is sometimes helpful to me to say, well, if I don't start doing it um, because I'm too afraid, of making mistakes or I feel too awkward, I'll never get there. So I try and think, you know, God willing, <laughs> I'll grow into this somehow, you know, over, over with the, you know, with the goodness of the community to help. Yeah. No, I think, that, I think that, I think that's exactly right. And we, we have a couple of questions here that are, are related to one another that pick up with both with what you were mentioning, Allison, and then both uh, Darrell and Darnell. And the, the questions essentially get to, you know, what are the, um, what are the practical first steps for parishes who are seeking to try to open the doors of these silos? Or, you know, how do we gain more of this, you know, intercultural or intergenerational sensitivity to allow for fullness of inclusion and representation in liturgy? And I want to say just a couple of things before opening that up. Tomorrow, our conversation, it'll be at 1 p.m. Central, is a specific conversation on representation in liturgical planning. Um, so we'll get into a lot of, you know, here's a model and a structure, um, perhaps getting to some other resources. Here is a, a real sort of a practical roadmap for planning purposes. So that's not to say we can't answer those questions now, but just know that we'll be looking forward to that. And so the, these questions that get to how do we do this, how do we open doors, I think go back to, first of all, um, being grounded in that growth versus fixed mindset, right? Sort of that Carol Dweck sort of idea of, of um, sort of this positive psychology, right? And also go back to, you know, many of the things we're talking about when it comes to inclusion is if, if the inclusion is on the, um, the most visible external 
check the box because we had the song in French, check the box because we had the gospel song at the end of you know, communion, check the box because etc. But we don't have relationship, meaning we also don't have members representing the fullness of experience in our community at the table, making decisions, part of the planning process, in positions of power, authority, decision making. Um, that's what helps keep us in the you know, lip service, check the box tokenism. If we don't have people in situations to make decisions, we're not going to have the fullness of that experience. It's gonna be always channeled through someone who's gonna be making presumptions and gonna miss the point, mm -hmm. right? So I think you know, to, to bring some of those things together from the earlier part of our conversation is putting people in those situations of decision and consultation and dialogue as opposed to speaking on behalf of. Right. Um, so, so again, these questions of practical, how do we break open the silos, um, other practical considerations, other practical um, suggestions for how we do this? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. You know, William Bochum wrote these sets of gospel preludes. William Bochum is, uh, was at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, composition teacher for many years. And so he didn't know how to even begin. So the first thing he did, in Michigan, you have a, a plethora of Kojig churches, mm -hmm. um, Church of Jesus Christ, Church of God in Christ, Kojig. Um, as a holiness sect of the Pentecostal, and they're mostly black. So he brought his tape recorder, set it on the Hammond B3, and pressed record. And he has thousands of recordings from their services to understand how that style was. And so that's an extreme radical form of being in relationship with not only an individual, but being in relationship with a tradition. Um, because my tradition does not look like your tradition. Um, and so send somebody, if you have paid staff members, they don't have to worship at your church every Sunday. As part of their job, send them to other communities as not reconnaissance and not field work but to genuinely understand what's happening. But what we do is we just call our buddy at the next church and we say, how y'all handling this? That's fine, that'll get you through the weekend. But if you want to go beyond that, it's gonna take more than just a phone call. Um, and Dr. Benders has her own story with this. And I, I wish we could hear more of her story about how she's in relationship with not only people, but, a, but an entire tradition. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll say, I mean do you want to do you want to say do you want to say something about that? Because I mean, I, I, again, I, I agree that would be a you know helpful helpful. Well, I'm helpful. thinking that this is our conversation yesterday about um, I started. I said to myself that if I take social justice and racial justice seriously, I should get experiences, not sit in my ivory tower. So I attend a church in Oakland, California, St. Columbus, which worships in the African American tradition. And um, what I talked about was the really being decentered and and recognizing that I entered into somebody else's community and so grateful for being welcomed and what I've learned there. But really to say that this is um, uh, that I can't be front and center because of my education or whatever you know all of us are accustomed I think especially as white people to be running things and to enter a space where by the grace of God, I'm welcome there, really has been extraordinary. So that um, courage, and then I found that um, people welcomed me. Um, the other thing I also want to say real quickly, the other thing in my mind is there are a lot of corporate, this is completely different, so thank you, Darnell, for that. But um, there are corporate tools, like doing a campus survey, um, I, we've used at universities. What are your images like? What's your language like? What's this? And you don't want an empty report. But that kind of examination could invite the community to say, you know, from uh, using this data to ask, what do we really do? What does it feel like here? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I, we're, we're at this point where, and, and I know we're, we're approaching the end of our hour. We're going to go just a couple minutes um, over because there's a, a, a one or two other things I wanted to get to. But, um, you know, we're at this point where not only is this Im important because it gets to the heart of who we are, these questions about inclusion. But also, um, we so much of our belonging, so much of our um, connection is re related to our experience of parish units, 
which are all fundamentally changing, at least in the part of the country where I live, they are fundamentally changing because we have parishes that are merging or combining or grouping. In my diocese, every single parish will now become part of an area Catholic community. So we mm. have separate parishes, but we still uh, collaborate within a group. In the Northeast, we see parishes closing left and right, right? And, and parishes that were built on the Polish parish, the Irish parish, the German parish model, and now are suddenly, you know, combining. And that will continue. And even in areas where there's growth in the church and parishes are being founded, they're huge parishes. And so questions of relationship, belonging, ownership, heritage, identity, all of these things are affecting everybody in every parish and every corner of the country. And so these conversations and the willingness to ask the hard questions are going to be imperative for all of us. And so I, I want to want to mention that, not because, of course, we're going to answer that in the two minutes that we have left. If we could answer it in the two minutes we had left, we're going to sink a well, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but to say this is not even scratching the surface. This is scratching the scratch on the surface because this gets to the heart of our overall structure in everywhere, right? Um, Brent uh, asked a question here. How can we have the conversation of redistribution of power in the relationship dynamics without freaking out those in power in regard to the inherent loss of power through that shift or does it matter? Again, that's, that's the type of question, that's the type of, of examination of power and, and, and structure that, that we're getting to that we all have to continue to ask ourselves about. So I see um, Brian has in the chat, you know, we need a part two. We barely made, it, barely made it off the runway. I would suggest we are just taxiing towards the runway still in this yeah. conversation because of, because of all these other dynamics. So, so here's what I'd like to, to suggest. Um, I mean, we, we clearly need more conversation about this. And uh, Bishop Mark Seitz joined us yesterday, um, spoke with our colleague Peter Kolar about risk and the gospel. And it was a wonderful beginning to this conversation, giving ourselves permission to ask tough questions. We started to begin to wrap our minds around this concept of inclusion and why it matters and what the barriers are. Um, tomorrow, we'll be looking at representation and planning. On Friday, we're looking at cultural appropriation, cultural expectation. And again, these, these will be further scratches on the surface. And, um, and I know we'll commit to having more conversations, and I hope we can have, have all of you back to talk more about them. Um, I have a couple of last minute details, and then I'm going to ask all of you, we're going to go in order around the horn here, Allison, Darrell, Darnell, Father Bradley, sort of your own takeaways, either for yourself or takeaways suggested for people who have joined us to think more about as, again, we're beginning these conversations. So I'll give you a second to think about that. Well, for those of you who have joined us live, I'll tell you again, this um, has been recorded. We'll be putting this out on Facebook as a rebroadcast. We'll be putting this on YouTube so you can watch it again. You can share it with other members of your own faith community, your pastoral team, your music ministry to begin to engage and help um, with these conversations. So please look for that. We'll also send to all of you who registered for this conversation a list of resources, um, other things you might want to consider. We'll have links to where you can find Dear Church and other, other things that might be helpful in the conversation. And we'll follow up with you about any future conversations we'll be able to have going forward. So please look for those as well. Um, we know we're starting to open the can of worms and we want to keep it opening and we want to pour it out and we want to you know really suss through all this so we we commit to having more of these conversations as time goes on so final thoughts takeaways um allison if we could begin with you sort of what what you'll carry with you from this conversation into the days ahead um what i'll take uh, take away from this is the conversation about relationship as really fundamental and my touch point in that is actually my experience at saint columbus being um, welcomed for who I am. And that's when I think about what could happen here is that we can actually, as a church and a nation, when can we shed these barriers and hierarchies of race so that we're welcome as people and welcome each other as people, who we are. Great, thanks. Darrell. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for having me. Uh, I think in going about this conversation and doing the work of, of inclusivity is don't be afraid to make mistakes. Venture out, try things. And if it doesn't work, don't let that be an excuse to not go further into the work. Continue doing the work and it's, it's gonna be uncomfortable and, and you're not, we're not gonna get it right. I don't get it right, uh, but that, that, 
that doesn't stop me from trying. And I'm allowed to go into spaces and to help others try to cultivate this work. Just don't try to be perfect, but be uh, always continuing in the process of being in inclusive. Wonderful, great. Darnell. I want to uh, echo what Dr. Bender said about relationship. But for me personally, I think I am also going to add another R word to that. And that is to simply reconsider what church will look like from this point forward. And this is not a new question. Peter had to do it. Paul had to do it, right? Churches throughout the ages have had to take this hard look at themselves to see, because it's not going back to what we knew before. And so, so reconsider. And that's simply looking at the stars again and seeing what you've seen all your life and trying to find something new. That when you get back to the, to the etymology of the Latin word of consider. So um, our gaze needs to be broad. And what we've seen our entire life, we need to look at it again mm -hmm. because we miss some stars along the way. Okay. Bradley. Yeah, I think one of the, if we believe that everything in the life of our church begins in and flows back to worship, which it, it rightfully should, imagine if we began in small ways to get this right in our worship. Imagine how the other structures of exclusivity that are a part of our church um, would begin to crumble because from the very source and summit of what we do, we're beginning to recognize who actually is at the table and ensuring that their voice is heard and ensuring that they're seen. And so if we get this right in worship, I believe that we can begin to get this right as a church. And so in this, in the, you know, the four broken vessels that Matt has put together for this webinar, we've certainly shared wisdom, but I think among us, you know, could be the next Oscar Romero or Dorothy Day or Henry Nowen or Thea Bowman, who has spoken to the church and challenged her to be better and be what she should always be. And so there's risk involved with that for everyone. But I think there's a greater risk in not speaking the truth to power that we know needs to be spoken in our church. So whatever you've gleaned from this moment, do something small. Um, in the next year. And then, you know, on the anniversary of this webinar, if you haven't done anything, ask yourself why. And then start again and try and be inclusive. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you all so much. I mean, I, I really appreciate you you being here and five five broken vessels on the call, by the way. Um, <laughs> I really, really appreciate the um the the just the thoughtfulness and the the openness and, and you know it's being in dialogue is is so important about this and it can be tricky you know for for all of us regardless of of our position or where we serve so thank you for entering into that so generously um and i hope we can have you back again to continue deepening the scratch on the surface here thanks to all of you who participated live thanks to all of you who are watching this in the rebroadcast we really appreciate it and we hope you can join us for another summer series conversation soon until then thanks very much and god bless bye-bye thanks it's been a gift yeah. hi everyone